That is very good. The swing works the Oracle again. And the Oracle bowled in. That is out. Great theatre, magnificent drama. First match of the season, eh, huh? First match of the season, Martin. King Willow's on his throne and all is right with the world. Gods and flannelled fools. Um, <laughs> it's from a poem about cricket. Oh, very apt. How does it go on, my old Helen? That's the only line I know. <laughs> oh, well, never mind. You certainly made the point. Hello, and welcome to Gods and Flannelled Fools, Episode 7, Bradman's Invincibles. This is the series in which I walk through a history of English Test Match cricket, focusing on key series, matches, players and teams of a particular interest. Basically, I explore the myths and legends of the game that collectively have led to how we view Test Match cricket today. Now, if you haven't already listened, my pilot episode, which is a brief history of the game up to the very first two Test Matches in 1877, is available, as well as the first six episodes, in which I discuss the birth of the Ashes in 1882, the great series of 1902, the legendary bowler Sidney Barnes, the opening partnership of Hobbs and Suchcliffe, the famous Bodyline series of 1932-33, and then the career of Wally Hammond, who led England in the last ever timeless test. So very much worth checking those out on my channel and uh, subscribing. There's a Twitter profile for the series, at GFFpod, and I'll also make some notes in support of this on a blog, and that's available at godsandflanneldfools.blogspot.com. So please feel free to send feedback and comments, as any, uh, any form of feedback really will help me as I plan future content. Now, the first three episodes of this series were based predominantly around test series that took place prior to the outbreak of the Great War. And the next three uh, on events prior to the outbreak of World War II. And naturally, those events had a huge impact on the sporting world, just as they did on, of course, every facet of human life throughout that period. Many promising young players had their careers disrupted, uh, their careers put on hold, erased, or even in some cases, you know, tragically, they lost their lives. Um, by the same token, many established players lost huge chunks of their career, or in many cases had their careers brought to an early end. And with World War II lasting six years and effectively postponing professional cricket by seven years until its resumption in 1946, many players fell into this bracket and failed to emerge from the other side in any meaningful way. Uh, Wally Hammond, whose career I touched on in the previous episode, falls very much into this bracket because although he did briefly resume playing, he, he basically took retirement in 1947. And as an Englishman, one wonders what uh, you know, he could have achieved had the war not have occurred. Um, there were, however, exceptions to this rule, and one such exception was Don Bradman. Now, the Gods and Flannelled Fool series is principally concerned with English cricket, so I will actively avoid focusing too much on opposing players um, as a matter of focus. But, of course, it's impossible to avoid more than a passing reference to, ba uh, to, to Bradman. Um, a player who, by any frame of judgment, was really the most extraordinary sportsman of his era and has gone, uh, gone down since that point, uh, not only as the greatest batsman of all time, um, but perhaps also the greatest sportsman of all time, if, if statistics are to go by. Um, as I discussed in episode five, his prolific run scoring led to Jardine's strategy of body line. And, I mean, even in that Ashes series, with the Australian batsman taking a complete pummeling, he continued with an average of over 50. His, his technique of holding his body still while maintaining a grip and a backlift in an arc towards the slip cordon, um, whilst it was unconventional, particularly at the time, it allowed him to transition smoothly between attack and defence, picking up line and length very early. And bowlers just couldn't find a weakness. Um, indeed, England failed to win any of the six subsequent Ashes series following body line. And by the time World War II began, 
Bradman had amassed 21 centuries and at the age of 31 would, uh, would have ordinarily been entering his peak as a cricketer. When normal service resumed after the war, uh, Bradman, aged 38, continued his career, much to the despair, I'm sure, of opposition sides. And while it was generally felt that his powers were, were at that point on the wane, he continued to score prolifically and would eventually amass another eight test centuries before retirement. Um, many of his centuries, of course, uh, I think 12, in fact, were, were double centuries or greater. In the summer of, uh, of 1948, the third full English season following the war, uh, Bradman led an Australian team to England, which was his fourth and final Ashes tour and the first Ashes series in England since the war. Um, not only was he to be captain, but he was also given a role as a selector. And having announced his forthcoming retirement, the tour was very much billed as a, almost a celebration of his career. Um, sadly for England, it would turn out perfectly for Australia as Bradman's team would henceforth become known as the Invincibles. That is very good. The swing works, the Oracle again. England had toured Australia in 1946 to 47 under the captaincy of Wally Hammond, who would shortly retire from the game. And it had been a largely unhappy series which had really highlighted how blighted by the war English cricket had been. Not only was it an ageing side with a depleted bowling attack, but the MCC had viewed the tour principally as an exercise in goodwill. Um, they obviously had the Bodyline series in the back of their minds and wanted to emphasise sportsmanship following the, the war years. And this decision and, and point of focus really seemed to impair the English team, who was soundly beaten 3-0, um, and had to contend with some particularly poor umpiring decisions, which went against them. So by the time the 1948 series arrived, Hammond had gone, and England was still struggling to find their best eleven. Uh, the younger players had obviously missed a chunk of first-class cricketing experience, and the older players in the side were, were way past their best. Australia, by comparison, had no such issues. They, they boasted a formidable batting lineup, led, of course, by Bradman, but included Neil Harvey and their own Sid Barnes, um, and had a fast bowling attack that included Ray Lindwell and Bill Johnson. Their jewel in the crown, however, was Keith Miller, uh, a flamboyant personality nicknamed Nugget, who was perhaps the first truly great all-rounder of the game. He was, he was capable of blasting runs as well as um, uh, you know, being a swashbuckling top-order batsman, and then he could bowl a side out with, at times, quite hostile pace. Having served in, in the military during the war, he, he principally viewed the game as, as something to be enjoyed and that there was far more to life than cricket. Um, and this was a philosophy that really clashed with Bradman's more puritanical view of, you know, let's win at all costs. Um, here's some thoughts on him from Michael Charlton during his interview with Brian Johnson on Test Match Specials, A View from the Boundary. I said about Hamlet, you know, had, had he been put on, he, he was likely to have proved most royal. I, I think that Miller uh, knew more about the game than many people have forgotten. It was, was a, a, a most inspiring figure. But he had this lovely casual approach and oh, everything yeah. he did. Oh. Uh, you, you, I think you've got a rather good story about on one occasion he was in New South Wales. <laughs> I'm, Johnny, I'm not sure you... You can I tell you, sure. what? you have my permission to tell No, no, no. no yes, no, you can. No, you must do, otherwise I shall. Uh, much better for you to. What? No, no, no. Another yes. bastion falls. No. <laughs> well, um... <laughs> <laughs> he... I, I, know, I know that because Jimmy Burke, who died so tragically, mm -hmm. um, uh, told me this. That it was at a match we were all at at Newcastle. It must have been on the way to a test, I think, in Brisbane. And Miller, Miller was captain of the New South Wales side for some, I can't say, must have been a country match anyway. And they walked out on the morning, rather hot sun, and I remember Miller's eyes were, were shielded against the sun this particular morning, and, and Burke said to him, as they walked out, I think he was the younger, youngest member of the side, and he said, um, uh, excuse me, Nugget, they all called him Nugget, um, excuse me, Nugget, we've got, there are, there are 12 men, he said. And Miller, <laughs> without turning around, said, 
well, somebody bugger off then. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 went, and went striding on. And just kept on, didn't even look round, yes. But he, always, he, but he had this wonderful habit. And they won the game, though. He had this wonderful <laughs> habit, which you do quite well, Mike. He used to sort of always give a bit of a cough before he played, didn't he? Yes, I can't do that. Burke could do it perfectly. <coughs> yes, he was clear his throat. Cold, cold. Cold. Yes, somebody leaves the field then. Uh, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Burke. So Australia arrived in England to a wild fanfare of support, seemingly with all bases of their team covered, and their efforts did not fail to disappoint, with Don Bradman publicly proclaiming from the outset that he wanted to remain unbeaten, which was an unprecedented feat in any touring side to that point in cricketing history. Now the first test at Trent Bridge resulted in a comprehensive eight-wicket victory for Australia, with Bradman scoring 100, and only Dennis Compton, the promising English batsman who had emerged just prior to the war, offering resistance against the, the Australian quicks uh, with an impressive 184. And the margin of victory was even greater at Lords, where England were crushed by 409 runs. And then only rain saved them at Old Trafford. Uh, again, Compton making 100 in a game in which opener Len Hutton was controversially dropped uh, for a perceived weakness against the pace attack. Now, this draw was the only real crumb of comfort for England throughout the entire summer as Australia continued to dominate. and They, they won the majority of matches and, and remained defeated throughout, with uh, Bradman really ignoring Miller's protests at his hard-nosed attitude, um, especially uh, during what had been regarded as, as festival matches. Um, so the, the, the matches against the, the lower county sides of, of lesser ability. Uh, on one such occasion, Australia had scored a massive 721 runs in a single day against Essex. Uh, you know, this is something that you can you can only imagine the likes of Alan Border or Steve Waugh doing several decades later as the, the ruthless Australian streak really took hold. So following the, the solitary draw in the Test Series, um, Australia won the fourth Test at Headingley by seven wickets to go 3-0 up in, in the Test Series with... Don Bradman making his 29th and final 100 in a successful run chase. And the teams then took to the Oval, where the Aussies wrapped up a 4-0 test victory with a mammoth innings and 149-run defeat of England. Uh, really quite depressing for, for England on home soil. Uh, and this, this ensured their status as the Invincibles. And this particular match was most famous for Bradman's final innings. Um, he knew it would be his last test, but he could not have known that he would only get one shot at, uh, at the crease because England were bowled out for a pitiful 52 runs in the first innings with uh, Ray, Wind uh, Ray Lindwell sorry, causing havoc on a, on a green, damp wicket. It must have been very difficult to bat on. Arriving at the crease with 6,996 test runs to his name, he needed only four to finish his career with 7,000 runs and a test average of 100. And despite the fact that England were being battered by their opposition, the crowd um, uh, gave him a standing ovation. And the English team sportingly gave him three cheers. Uh, however, uh, this sort of elevated ceremony seemed to have an effect on him because he was bowled by the spinner Eric Hollies for a second ball duck to leave him on an average of 99, something that still remained over 35 runs more than the next highest batting average to this day. So uh, I, I think we can temper any sense of failure, but it's, uh, it's certainly an extraordinary um, uh, sporting statistic that, uh, 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 that, uh, that is so widely known across all sports to this day. When England took the field, Barnes and Morris made a good start and Barnes' wicket fell at 117. Enter Don Bradman, who got a great ovation. Don Bradman walked out to bat, needing only four runs to average 100 in Test cricket. I was not aware that it was going to be my last innings. Uh, neither was I aware at that stage that I only wanted four runs to have a Test match average of 100. And uh, it was a pretty emotional occasion because Yardley called all his fieldsmen around and they all gave me three cheers before I took block. Now, if that doesn't upset anybody, well, I'm a bad judge. It would have, would have killed me, and, um, and I'm sure that it must have affected him. 
and to get uh, to get over those first few balls would have been tremendously hard for him to do. Ollie's bowling and Don playing perhaps his last test innings here. As Holly pitches the ball up slowly and he's bowled. Gladman bowls Holly's no. Bowled Holly's no. Silence. Absolute silence. It was an extraordinary thing that had happened, you know. There was dead silence when he got bowled. Amazing. You could hear a pin drop right round the ground. The great man had been bowled for a duck. What do you say under those circumstances? I wonder if you see a ball very clearly. In your last test in England, the ground where you played out some of the biggest cricket of your life, and where the opposing team have just stood round you and given you three cheers, and the crowd has clapped you all the way to the wicket. I was a trifle unlucky in, in the sense that I played at the ball and actually hit it on the inside edge of the bat and pulled it onto the stumps. Um, but I think if I'd taken a, a little bit more care, I might have got away with it. But that's one of the things that happens. In the game. Thoughts there from uh, Don Bradman uh, in, in old age, looking back and uh, speaking with some of his contemporaries as well. It must have been... Uh, it must have been an, an, an amazing experience there at the Oval at the end of the summer. Um, and as I say, that, that whole thing around the statistics and uh, his final innings is uh, it's an extraordinary story. So all in all then, a, a record-breaking tour for Australia and a, and a humiliating one, um, if we're honest, for England. Uh, the Australian side, the Invincibles, uh, remain the only side to this day to tour England unbeaten. And uh, they've gone down as one of the greats in all of history. Um, only perhaps behind the West Indies team of the 1980s. Uh, although some contest uh, their, their sort of status level, um, claiming that much of their success was down to the weakness in the English game at the time following the war. Um, it did, however, mark something of a turning point in the history of the Ashes, because whilst they would lose the next series away in Australia, England developed a greater resolve as a result of the, uh, the experience of 1948. And many of the players who were a part of that side had time to, to further develop their game and become established as genuine household names. And that included names such as Compton, Edrich, Bedser, Laker and Hutton. And by the time the Australians visited English shores uh, for the next tour, the tables would turn. And indeed, for the next episode of Gods and Flannelled Fools, we'll move to the 1950s, a decade in which England redressed the ba balance of power back into their favour. Until then, I hope you enjoyed listening to Gods and Flannelled Fools. Please uh, provide your feedback and, of course, subscribe. Bye for now.